it's pretty easy to get what's called a provisional patent now for a couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And you can do that on legal zoom two or 300 bucks. I think it costs. And that, that gets you a bar date and what's called your bar date. And it also gets you a, a sort of a bookmark in history to protect your idea. You only have a year though. You got to convert it after a year, but that's very important to know also. So if you like your idea, go ahead and file a quick patent on it. It's called a provisional patent. You have one year to convert it, but it, it, proves to the world that this was your idea and that becomes the date and time because patent law is all about first to file. Hello and welcome to the Lewis and Kyle Show, an interview podcast where my friend Lewis and I interview really interesting, high-performing people. We interview entrepreneurs, rappers, CEOs, investors, creators, really the whole enchilada. Uh, today, we've got someone very interesting and I'm going to let Lewis tell you a little bit about him. Yeah, in this episode, we interview Dr. Richard Schatz. He is most well-known for co-inventing the heart stent. You probably know someone who has a heart stent if you don't have one yourself. It is one of the most significant inventions, innovations of the past 100 years, and it's impacted over 100 million people directly and probably 10 to 100 times that indirectly when you consider the friends and family of the people who have had one. We talked with him about inventing that, what it was like, bringing that to the world, as well as his thinking about invention in general and how to make inventing and getting patents more approachable for everyone. We also discuss heart health. He is a cardiologist after all, and I eat a lot of meat. So that was an interesting intersection of ideas. And we also get towards the end, a very interesting segment on what it was like to operate on world leaders. That's just a little teaser into all we covered in this awesome conversation with Dr. Schatz. I hope you learn as much as we did. Enjoy. Dr. Schatz, welcome to the Lewis and Kyle Show. We are very excited for this conversation. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to, to participate and share some stuff with you, whatever you want. Well, thank you so much. We want to start out asking some fun questions. We've had a, a series of interesting themes on the podcast. Kyle and I are both, to an extent, self-experimenters. I was an extreme vegan, extreme carnivore, and so there's a lot of debate about things that we're not qualified to talk about and you are extremely qualified to talk about. So I want to start out by asking you overall what your perspective is on the carnivore diet as a cardiologist. Well, I think there is a lot of mystique and there's also a lot of noise out there about what is and is not good for you. It's a fairly passionate business with not a lot of data. I think there's a lot of anecdotal stuff, but uh, since I'm in the business of fixing hearts and all my patients come with that same question, uh, I'm a little different than most. I, I think that your diet ought to just be common sense and moderate, nothing in two extremes, because you kind of have to forget, most people forget that what the purpose of medicine is. And I teach this to all of our young fellows, and the purpose of medicine is not to prolong life. If you ask your young doctors, what's the purpose of medicine, they'll usually say, well, we want to prolong life. The answer is no. It's not the right answer. The answer is to relieve suffering and to improve your lifestyle. So. I think you should have a diet that you can live with that you are that's not so extreme that you don't enjoy yourself eating is a sort of a guilty pleasure for all of us and unless you have extreme risk factors for coronary disease and you really have to have your cholesterol really really low in that exception then you know most diets are are just fine uh, i don't think there's any data to suggest that one is better than the other but my message to everyone, including my patient, patients, is just that you have to live also. And I'm a good example of that. I actually tried to go on a low-carb diet, and after about 30 days, I was pretty much suicidal. I was getting so surly because I wasn't enjoying myself because I like carbs. I decided, you know what, I think I'll die a couple weeks early, and I'll just enjoy my life for the next 40 years. So sort of a funny way to look at it, but I wouldn't get too extreme on the diet stuff. If you want to lose weight, there's no mystery to losing weight. There's no mystery. You just have to spend more calories than you take in. And how many fat marathoners do you see? Very, very few. <laughs> None. <laughs> so, so there's a reason. And so if your goal is weight loss, weight loss is as easy as it can be. You just have to spend more calories. So you have to exercise. You have to have the will to do it. If you're looking for a health reason, and let's say you do have a high proclivity for coronary disease and you might be at risk there are people like that out there we call those the homozygotes they have hyperlipoproteinemia of an extreme kind 
or even at a young age, they have cholesterols in the five and six hundreds. Those people, there you might want to be a little more, uh, <clears throat> a little more strict about what you take in. But the medications that we have nowadays are so good. Specifically, the PCSK9 inhibitors that just came out a few years ago are extraordinary. They can drop your cholesterol so low, it's, it's barely measurable. And they're able to show now with many years of follow-up that that, that, that actually, even, even in the homozygotes, actually do very well. So, I don't know, to answer your question, I think, uh, you know, diets are fine, but you have to enjoy yourself, too. You have to live a little. Well, I hope that Lewis hears you loud and clear because he only operates on the extremes when it comes to diet. Yeah. <laughs> After decades as a cardiologist, I, I know that there's things that you see over and over again in people's habits and their lifestyle that leads to, to uh, you know, the degradation of their cardiovascular health. So it, what things, you know, if you had three things to tell everyone that they should do in order to keep themselves healthy, what would you uh, prescribe? Heart healthy, right, Kyle? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's really what not to do and what not to do. Some things you can't control. You can't pick your parents, right? So if you have genetic predisposition like diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, or high cholesterol, family history, you, you can't pick your parents. So if you have all that, then you just have to modify what you can modify. There are some things that are, mo are modifiable, particular smoking is the worst thing. So mm -hmm. if you're smoking at a young age, you're gonna have a two, threefold risk of having a heart attack and dying way before someone else who doesn't. So that's something that you just can't do. Of course, there are people who smoke and live forever, but those are the exceptions. So we look at it in terms of the cumulative effect of multiple risk factors. So things you can modify are your blood pressure because you can take medicine, you can lose weight, you can exercise. If you're obese, these are things you can modify. And of course, don't, don't smoke. If you have diabetes, keep it under control. Family history, you can't change. Um, high cholesterol you can there's medication for that so it's really an awareness of what those risk factors are and modify what you can modify within reason the corollary to all that of course also is public awareness to make sure that you know what the warning signs are and mm -hmm. you guys are young you don't have to worry about it but if you are in your 50s and 60s and you have a lot of of those risk factors that we just talked about you're at a much higher risk for having something bad happen so that's where public information becomes important. And as patients, you have to be, take, be an active participant in your health care. So understand what those risk factors are. Even in 2021, I just had a patient the other day who was having symptoms for three months. And you just have to ask, what, 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 what were you doing? Did you tell anybody? No. Mm -hmm. so, well, he was lucky he didn't have a heart attack, but he was heading for one. So the minute that you develop symptoms, you have to know what those symptoms are. Then once they do appear, then you have to seek help immediately. Don't sit around the house. That's very helpful. What I have a question about the economics and kind of legal aspect of medical research. In when you were first inventing and involved with the Heartstead, I think randomized control trials were viewed completely differently than they are now. And it's kind of a running joke on Twitter about things like Beyond Burgers and oat milk that people say that it's fine because there's not randomly controlled tri trials. And it's like something that's become a buzzword yet again. Mm -hmm. Could you kind of explain the importance of those or the lack of importance of those and kind of how that's changed through time from a national perspective? Yeah, that's a good point. Most people don't appreciate that, but we started this work in the early eighties and there was no such thing as randomized trials. The FDA didn't even require them. Hard to believe compared to what we know nowadays. But as an example, when we started working on this, we had to build our first prototypes and we're ready to start human trials. I called the FDA personally. There were no computers then, of course, and no cell phones. There was just rotary phones and you would call them and they'd call you back or you send them a letter and you get a letter back a week later. So I, I spoke to the head cheese over there and I said, we have this device. We want to put it in humans. Where do we start? Do we have to do a big randomized trial? He says, no, we don't do randomized trials. People, it's hard to believe, but nowadays you can't get away with that. But the essence of all basic research is a randomized trial. And that's because there are so many variables that will influence your outcome. And if you're not careful, a poorly designed study will actually give you false results. No better example than the COVID crisis now with all of this anecdotal noise about all the drugs that are supposed to be working and all of the arguing that goes on. 
which is foolish because in the absence of randomized trials, everything's anecdotal. And the, the issue that you have is that the power of the placebo effect is extraordinary. And if you don't control for that, you will have a worthless study. And I've seen companies spend a billion dollars on a trial, but they didn't design it properly. And because of that, and because of the placebo effect, after a billion dollars in usually 10 years, the study is completely worthless. So the FDA now does require uh, randomized trials for pretty much everything as it should be. But you have to be very careful as an investigator and as a sponsor, you have to be extremely careful. And the reason is that doctors will cheat and patients will cheat. And I did 20 years of stem cell research after we worked on all the stem stuff. And and for 20 over 20 years, I did probably over 20 randomized trials for stem cells looking at uh, improvement in heart function and also re reduction in angina. And it really became very obvious that placebo is very powerful. And if you have a patient who has no options, has crippling chest pain, and you tell them, if you don't have a blinded trial and just tell the patient you're getting stem cells, well, he's going to feel better. So when it's blinded, that means you don't know what the patient got and the patient doesn't know what they get. And even in that scenario, patients will talk themselves into getting better. And you have to be really, really careful about that. So that, that's why the randomized trials are so important. They have to be double-blinded. They have to be meticulously done. And it's the only way you can actually draw significant conclusions that are meaningful. That's incredible. Um, I want to ask you something about your engineering background that you came from and how that's important to you. So my girlfriend's dad is an a orthopedic surgeon here in Birmingham. Um, and he got a, a chemical engineering degree and he touts that as being the most important thing he's ever done because it taught him how to solve problems. Um, would you consider your engineering degree to be, uh, uh you know, that important to you? Well, that's a funny story. So I don't even have a degree. I never, I never even ever graduated college, so I don't even have a degree. Um, my dad was an engineer and, and, uh, I don't know how I he was that. A, yeah, I'll, I'll tell that. It's a funny story. Um, my dad was a brilliant engineer in the space industry. So uh, my interest in math and science really is rooted in him, in him because he uh, was very, very influential in my, my schooling and everything, all the way from elementary school through high school. And I think it runs in our blood. My brother's the same way. He's a doctor also. Um, but we just have I have personally always had a knack for math and science. So the closest I came is to any engineering was after my first year of college. I needed to work for the summer and my buddy was an engineering student. He says, hey, why don't you just work with me in the summer for the government? You just have to tell them you're an engineer. So we faked all of our applications and then we took this online <laughs> engineering test and you had to get 65 to pass and I got a 65 on it and I, w I didn't have any engineering classes at all. So I became an official licensed fallout shelter inspector for the federal for the Department of Defense. And that's the closest I ever came to engineering. So for the next three summers, I would go out to California and I would uh, build you a, a building inspector. And uh, that's kind of a funny story. So uh, you don't have to graduate college to go to medical school. In the 70s, they would there were a few schools that would just accept you after 90 credits. So on a whim, I just decided to apply it as a sophomore. I took my MCATs as a sophomore instead of a junior, and I applied early. And lo and behold, I got in, and no one was more surprised than me. So I never did finish college. So I went right to medical school. And uh, But that was the extent of my engineering. But being a cardiologist, you you were definitely a tinkerer anyway because we deal with toys. The heart is nothing more than a fancy plumbing uh, uh, op application. So the heart is a brilliant piece of engineering because it obeys all the laws of science, all the laws of physics. And it's just a, an incredible hydraulic pump that's run electrically and then mechanically. And so you really can't do cardiology without really understanding basic engineering because everything we do relates to Ohm's law, Fourier analysis, uh, waveform analysis. All these things are basic engineering principles that you have to learn anyway. So it just turns out I think I have a bit of an aptitude for it. I, I would credit my dad for that because he he was like that as well. And so I think it was an unusual uh, 
pathway for me because it turned out to be probably the only thing I could really ever do. And even though we just, uh, yeah, I'm sure you saw in the resume, we won the Ross, Russ Prize for biomedical engineering. And uh, of course, Julio, my partner, was not an engineer either, but he was a tinkerer also. He just loved to tinker. So the two of us together were actually a very good team because we had that native inquisitiveness, but we also had the technical skills to be able to build and to tinker. So I think that's where it all came together. Well, that's an incredible story that came from a, a bad mm -hmm. question on my end. So I'm glad that I asked it, even though it was completely wrong. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask about Palma or Pal Palmas as well. Uh, how smart is he? And, and how quickly did you pick up on how smart he is? Yeah, he, he's one of the more interesting individuals you'll ever meet in the world. He's the most quiet and humble person when you meet him, but he's also uh, one of the smartest people I've ever met. And you see this in other geniuses. He's a genius, there's no doubt about it. And there is a relentless pursuit of knowledge, a relentless feeling that you just don't know what you need to know and you have to keep looking for answers. And we're all faced with dilemmas in our daily life. I actually talked to Lisa about this as well. And every day, your ordinary life has challenges and stumbles. But that part of your brain is not in the mode of solving the problem. It's in getting through the day, right? So every time something thwarts your everyday existence, instead of just cursing and walking by and say, darn, I wish that hadn't happened. Stop for a second and think about how should I fix it? And that's what Julio's like. And his story is amazing because he also was not an engineer. He was a young student in South America in La Plata, Argentina, and came from very, very humble beginnings. But he always wanted to be a doctor for a bunch of reasons. And he eventually ended up in the US because he wanted to do basic research. And <clears throat> It's an amazing story how he ended up doing that, but he's just one of those people that sees something and rather than turning away, he wants to fix it. And that's what I learned from him. And after uh, meeting him, uh, and we had six or eight patents on our of stent patents, then I went on and invented another dozen things. It's actually quite easy. It's not hard to do at all. And but a good example is before you guys were born, there were no remote key fogs for cars, right? This is one of my favorite examples. And so if you had to go out to your car at night, you had a key and you had a keyhole and you had to put the key in and somehow get the car door open, right? Now you would have no idea about that, but that's the way life was. So every car had enormous numbers of scratches all over the paint because in the night at nighttime, you'd be scratching the car, scratching the car. So ask yourself how many millions of people went out every night to their car and scratched the heck out of their paint before they could get the key in. So, and how many people would just curse and say, darn it, where's that keyhole? Well, who has the wisdom to stop and say, okay, that's really stupid, how can I fix that? So somebody just came up with the idea, why don't we put a little flashlight on the key? So somebody came up with the idea of putting a little flashlight on the key. As simple as that was, that was a million dollar idea. So millions of people had that challenge, but only one person decided to solve the problem. So as you go through your day, you'll see this over and over and over. And in the cath lab, when we're dealing with patients and problems that are mostly mechanical, they all have mechanical solutions. You just have to stop and say, okay, that's really dumb. Why are we doing it this way when we can do this? So that's where you have to change how your brain works. Your brain, part of your brain will tell you just to move on and just ignore it, but if you have to get into the mode of, of of kind of releasing all those creative juices in your brain and say, hey, hey, instead of that, let's just fix this, and within seconds, you'll come up with a, a solution, and then you file your patents, and you've got an idea. There's so many great ideas out there, and, and more to come, so many more ideas out there, and there's no reason why you, you couldn't do that yourself in any mode. It's like <clears throat> the guy who came up with the windshield wipers on the car, it's a great story, some of the great patents that were done through the years. There's always, a, there's always a solution, but you have to be prepared. Your brain has to be prepared to actually come up with an answer. Mm -hmm. But to get back to Julio, he, you know, he, he's a really brilliant guy, and it's relentless, though, for him. He's just, and even after we did the stint stuff, he continued to 
uh, look for solutions uh, to uh, for other problems as well. Well, it's just yeah. like a way of life, right? I mean, it's, it's the way that you look at the world and it's if there's problems, can you solve them rather than just attaching whatever band aid you can. Um, and I know that that's part of your uh, your sort of motto is one invention per day. And then the last part of it is sliding door moments. And so mm -hmm. I get the one invention per day mo part of this. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what a sliding door moment is and um, really how to decide whether or not to go through these sliding doors? Because I know the, the, mar the Marlboro Man, you know, like you decided not mm -hmm. to walk through that. That was probably wise. That's right. But uh, that could have that could have led you down a million different paths. So one, what is it? And then how do you decide whether or not to go through it? Yeah, that's a great question. So life is a series of sliding doors, <clears throat> meaning, and if you saw the movie with Gwyneth Paltrow, it's really a great movie. It's one of her first movies. And it's about a young girl in London whose life takes two very drastic turns on the, on the fate of just missing her, the tube in London, they call it the subway, door closed in one scene, and the next scene the door opens. So in one scene, the sliding door is open and she just happens to go in. In the next scene, she's delayed getting there, so the door closes, and her life takes a drastically different pathway. And it just reminds you how fickle life is, that at any point in time, doors will open and doors will close, and you may or may not go through them uh, based on fate. Uh, a lot of examples of that, like on 9-11, for instance, how many stories did you hear of people who missed the subway that morning mm -hmm. and they didn't get to, to work? They got there late and they survived or the people that got to work there didn't survive. So just by the mere fate of catching a flight or a train can change your life drastically. It happened to me. In fact, my 1979, my brother and I were leaving New York to go back. You know, we were both residents. He was in Hawaii. I was in San Francisco and we both were flying on United Airlines and uh, I was going to go with him the very last minute. Uh, I decided to go back to San Francisco. He decided to go right to Hawaii, which stopped, and his plane stopped in Portland. Back then, you could do that. You could just show up at the gate and change your plans, you know, <laughs> for, for $20. So his plane crashed, and mine didn't. So he was in a big DC-10 that went down in Portland. And I would have been on that plane, but not for the fate of me, just for some strange reason, deciding that I was, I was going to go to San Francisco. So these are the kind of things um, that remind you that your life hangs in the balance and it's a tight rope that we all walk but the doors are always opening and closing what you can't be is you can't be afraid and for young people the best message is do not be afraid to fail because failure is how you eventually succeed there's an old story that i i heard from a good friend of mine named boone pickens who was a billionaire oil man and he said don't ever listen to a billionaire who said he was never bankrupt. He said, I was bankrupt four times. He said, you can't become a billionaire without taking chances. And when you take chances, you're going to fail. But eventually it's going to hit. And you learn from each one of those experiences. And that's how you become successful. I gave a talk at the at UCSD Business School years ago. They're all young graduate students in their early 20s, all very, very bright and just about in, to embark on their careers. And after the talk, we just did a little question and answer. I had two or three of the same question from the, from the kids. And it was, well, Dr. Schatz, uh, I have three degrees. I got my undergraduate, my master's. I got this degree, that degree. I've got a business degree. I'm an engineer and I'm 23 years old. And uh, I just got this offer from a company and, and, uh, I don't know if I should take it because it's a small company. I said, what's the problem? Well, you know, what if I get in this company and I, I, I waste two or three years and the company fails? I go, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. What are you afraid of failing for? Mm -hmm. If I had two people interviewing for a job for me and one had been in four startup companies that all failed and the other fellow let's say worked for General Motors for six years, a nice cush job, no risk, and they were applying for the same job, who would I pick? I'm gonna take the guy that flopped four times because he learned a lot more than the other guy did. The guy, other guy just learned not to take chances and play it safe. And there's another great story out there, which I am told is true, but it was a huge company. It might've been Xerox or one of the 
big, big billion dollar companies, the Fortune 500 companies. And there was a young uh, fellow that worked for him and he screwed up a contract that cost the company like $2 million because he made some tactical errors. And he was certain he was gonna get fired. So he went home to his wife and said, look, we better plan on moving because I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get fired this week. I made the biggest blunder and I couldn't hide it. Everybody knows it, I'm gonna get canned. <laughs> So he gets called into the CEO, the president CEO's office. He goes, I'm sure you know why you're here. And he goes, yes, sir, yes, sir, I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry. I says, well, I just wanna let you know I'm gonna promote you. I said, you're gonna promote me? He says, yeah. Yeah, I think you're good management material. He says, well, I thought you were gonna fire me. He says, why should I fire you? I just spent $2 million training you. Hmm. So the point is, you got to make mistakes in your life, especially when you're young. There's no mistake you can make that you cannot recover from. And the benefit from all those mistakes will be, in the end, a very, very successful career. If you play it safe, yeah, you might be successful, but you're not going to really reach the levels that you really want to, especially young guys like you. I can tell you've got an entrepreneurial spirit. You want to break the rules. You want to be successful. So... What were you doing now? This pot doing your podcast? That took some effort, probably a little risk, and if not money, but certainly time. And it's not a waste of time at all. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, you move on. You find something else. So that, that's well, kind of a good way to look at it. I mean, we're we're talking to the guy that invented the stent, so I think <laughs> I think <laughs> it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that wasn't a certainty either. There was a lot of hurdles for that too. There were a million oh, ways yeah. that should have failed. Yeah, there's only one way it could have worked, but there are a million ways it should have failed. But it was just a matter of uh, perseverance and believing that we had the we had the right formula. And despite the headwinds and all the naysayers and all the people that said it wasn't going to work, and that's why we started our own company because uh, no one would no one would believe it could work. So we just did it on our own. Turned out we were right. That's crazy too, since your story, at least you know, relative from my perspective of creating a stent is in the distant past. And it's, I was you know, hearing a presentation you gave online and you talked about how no one believed in you at the start. And it's just so difficult to believe that it's one of those pieces of cliche advice that you hear in every story. No one believed in us at the start. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I just, I've heard that a million times. And then when I heard you say, it, I still like didn't believe it just but seeing how pervasive the stent is now. Mm -hmm. I mean, right before we started recording, you had shared with us how it's not even countable. Mm -hmm. like the implications what are like the ballpark figures of the wide-reaching use case of like this invention well, and the cascading inventions that followed it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well so that's what people don't appreciate when we started i knew personally that this device you could put it anywhere in the body and it was going to work and what you learn is that every body passageway suffers from collapse. And that's why balloons worked good, but not great. In fact, when we met the J&J &J guys, their head engineer, this guy named Mike Schuler, who was a Rutgers guy, I think, and he was a really, probably one of the smartest people I ever met. They put him in charge of marketing and development. And we gave the presentation and the first time he saw it, he was speechless and he said, I get it, the body is a series of tubes waiting to be stented. And I said, yes, it is. And he says, no matter where you put this, it's gonna work. So we had, I personally, I, I had visions that I thought, I think it's achieved probably even more than I expected, but the basic concept of a metal sleeve, once you figure out how to make it compatible, and that's what we did, the ripple effect and the other spin-off inventions are extraordinary. So just the coronaries, of course, are absurd. There's two, at least 2 million people a year maybe more now who get it, who get stents because they, they're getting better and better. They're easier to deliver. They come in all sorts of lengths. When we first started doing it, I was the only one in the world who could do it, right? Because I only one, only one who knew how to do it. And it was just this long and we had one balloon. Now they, now they come in every length you can imagine, every size you can imagine. So now we can tackle every vessel. Back then we couldn't. So just the coronary biz is extraordinary. But then the spinoffs, you know, the whole idea of a tabber, which is a, we, I took one of our, stents and I put a valve inside of it <clears throat> and we crushed mm -hmm. it and then we were going to put it inside the aortic valves. Everybody thought I was crazy. Um, that's, that was the very first Tavers, but we were so busy 
because we were working on carotids and renals and iliacs and femorals and coronaries and portocable cable shunts and aortic aneurysms. We had 10 projects and something had to give. So that's the one that we let pass because it was, it was too, we were way ahead of our time. But that's basically a stent. And years later, somebody filed the patents and now, now there's probably, uh, I don't know what the number is, probably half a million, maybe not that many, maybe three or 400,000 or more half a million tavers that are done every year worldwide. Those numbers I gave you, by the way, are probably just the U.S., so double it for the mm -hmm. world. So the TAVR, for instance, that is a Palma Shad stent with a valve inside of it. So there's another disorder of abdominal aneurysms, which had always been relegated for open heart, open surgery, where the, the surgeon would open up the belly and then replace the aneurysm. Well, we were the first to do it internally. So that was another one of our – that's a stent. So you take put a stent here and a stent there. You connect it with PTFE. So – that's a spinoff, but it's still the basic formula is a balloon expandable stent. Um, and then there, there are other applications in pediatrics and all that. So to answer your question, it's I don't even know what the number is, but it, it's millions. And what happens is the device gets better and better and better. As it gets better and better and easier and easier, the, the, then the indications start expanding and you start treating everybody. And probably the most dramatic is the treatment of a heart attack. There are half a million deaths every year from heart attacks. And heart attack is where a blood vessel just completely blocks and there's no flow to the heart. So your heart pumps eight tons of blood a day, 16,000 pounds of blood a day, and it needs food. Food comes from blood, and that blood comes from coronaries, the blood vessels. So think of it, your heart as a car engine. If Lewis is driving his Ferrari to Los Angeles at 120 miles an hour and someone cuts the fuel line, the engine dies. That's a heart attack. And that's what we don't want to happen. So we try and catch people before that happens, but sometimes we can't. So why that's important is that when I saw my first heart attack, heart attack patients in the 1970s, the mortality death was 30% in hospital, 30 days. 30% 30 of people, 20 to 30% of people, people would die. There's no treatment. There was no treatment for heart attacks. We didn't even know what really was causing it until the 1970s. And so you would have patients come in, young people too, 50-year-old people, men, women, and they would have a heart attack and suffer a horrible hospitalization and eventually die of arrhythmias or heart failure. And we had nothing to do for, do for them. So in the 1970s, some guy had a, you know, in the 60s, they had an idea of doing open heart surgery. Uh, and then in the 70s, balloons for, for opening up blockages. But that 30% number is now two to 3%, and that's all because of stents. So a patient comes in, and they used to be in the hospital for eight weeks. That's how long that was the treatment for heart attacks. Now a patient comes in with a heart attack, and you, it takes about 20 minutes. And we go through the wrist here, these pediatric catheters. They're just two-millimeter catheters. We snake it inside the heart. And within minutes, the vessels open. Their pain goes away. The EKG settles down. And all of a sudden, the color comes back in their face, and they go home the next day. And they're playing golf two or three days later, and their heart is normal. It's like it never happened. Big difference from the 1960s and 70s when they suffered um, really a horrible death of heart failure and arrhythmias in the hospital for weeks and weeks and weeks, 30% mortality. So then, And that's all because of how good stents have become and how clever we've become in how to treat them with medications and, and um, post-op care and stuff like that. So just one of many, many examples. Um, a lot of the valves we do now are people that could not be operated on because they're too sick. A lot of these patients are 90 years old. You can't op you can't do open valve replacement on them because they'll, they're not going to make it. The mortality is 60 or 70 percent if you try and fix somebody. All those people are getting TAVRs now. Those are people that we were very, very happy just to let go. You just tell the family, hey, grandpa's not going to make it. Let's just make him comfortable. Mm -hmm. We actually did a 103-year-old guy <laughs> uh, wow. a few years ago. My partner did it. and. Uh, 103, he actually did great. And, you know, I, I think he lived for several more years, but symptom free. So that's the ripple effect that you actually mentioned there, Lewis. And uh, it, you can't even put a number on it. What's amazing is no. its longevity and that nothing's replaced the stent. It's been 30 years and nothing will. Nothing is going to, for as long as I'm going to be around, nothing is going to replace it. I don't see anything that's going to replace it. It's just too, it's too easy. The engineering is so great. The drugs are so great. They're drug coded now. The access is so much better. Uh, there'll be incremental improvements, but 
um, nothing on the horizon unless we come actually with a cure for coronary disease where like when you're a child and you're at risk, they give you a gene or something and mm. you don't get it. So that's Star Wars stuff. But no, I think the stent's here to stay. It's a, it's a great a great legacy and it ex certainly exceeded our expectations. So one, uh, one thing I want to, I, I want to say to, something, Lewis, one second. Okay, sure. jump in first. Um, so in the most recent um, Amazon shareholder letter, Jeff Bezos was talking about how uh, um, how many hours they had saved comp they had saved their customers and he was valuing the business based on that number of hours and it was like um you know just calculating it based on the the drive to the store or mm -hmm. um you know multiple different things and it, he ended up getting to a number like 300 billion dollars just huge numbers and I, as you were talking i was thinking about what the the value per hour i think he put ten dollars per hour for every hour they saved so if you could do that for a hundred million people, uh, ten dollars an hour after uh, for mm -hmm. every hour after the point at which they got their stint. It's like you, literally incalculable how much yeah. value this is uh, put yeah. into the world. And uh, yeah. but, but that you're talking about a dollar thing there, but just the emotional stuff too. The time with your family and lost time. Right. These people would be dead, you know, and they're. Yeah, but productivity, they go back to work. Yeah, you're right. It's it's very, That's actually a very good analogy. It is immeasurable. It is immeasurable. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's it's been said it's probably the greatest achievement in the last century. I always look at it. I mean, is that emotionally moving for you? Like, you if, if you weren't there, this probably would not have happened, you know? So, like... I guess it, I think it would have happened eventually because um, other people were working on some other. I think people would have stumbled across it later on, uh, but mm -hmm. we we had the pedal to the metal, and I, that was my contribution. I, you know, I get a lot more uh, I get a lot more credit than I deserve. I think because Julio had the fundamental idea, um, but he was more of the scientist in the lab, and I was sort of the bull in the china closet. And him, him being a radiologist, he worked in the large vessels, but the real money was going to be in the coronaries and the more emotional stuff because it's fatal. And that my contribution was really redesigning it, it to make sure it worked, that we could get it there, and then understanding the physiology and also the pharmacology. So that was my contribution, and that took years to do. But once we, once we figured it out, then everybody else just jumped on the bandwagon based on all of our early work. So I do get a, a lot of credit that I probably don't deserve. But at the same time, to answer your question, uh, yeah, I, I feel um, it's been so long, quite honestly, that I don't think about it too much anymore. Mm. I still do cases. I still do uh, a couple hundred cases a year. And I'll, I'm, I might do five cases or six cases in one day. And that's something you couldn't do years ago. We, my lab is very busy. We do 20 to 30 cases a day sometimes. And they're all stent cases, and you could never do that before because each case used to take four hours. Now it takes like ten minutes. So they do tavers now in an hour. My, I have these two partners who are so good at it. You can do an entire valve replacement in forty minutes. I've seen Dr. Stennis and Tierstein go in there and do a, a complete valve replacement in forty minutes. They'll they'll do six or seven in a day. Um, so the extrapolation of ease and then improvement in technology and everything is that's what's really pretty amazing but um, you know I'm, I'm usually assisting a younger doctor because we're training them and every time the nurse hands me the stent I, I, I put it on the wire for them and as it goes by I, I do kind of think about it I go hmm there it goes you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, and these of course these newer stents are so much better than ours but the fundamental principles are still the same so um, I wouldn't say it's lost on me I just think it's been 30 of 35 years you know so I don't uh, and I've moved on to other things, of course. I have other mm -hmm. stimulating things that keep me busy. But absolutely. Um, but um, whenever I meet somebody or in a crowd or I give a lecture, or somebody always comes up and they always say, you know, my dad had a stent or, you know, thanks for saving my my grandmother. I said, uh, okay, well, I didn't do anything. <laughs> but, um, but they're so prevalent. If you just walk in a room, which I've done, I give a lecture, maybe there'll be 500 people in the audience. I'll go, raise your hand if you have a stent or if you know somebody who has a stent. And every hand goes up. Every mm -hmm. hand goes up. Yep. There you go. So it's touched uh, millions of lives and, and all, for the, all for the better. So, and 
uh, Kyle, your point is really good about productivity and uh, and not just the act of doing it. It's just the ripple effect mm -hmm. of uh, lost productivity in life. So, yeah. There's a lot of interesting what, what I want to ways pivot to go to, there. Yeah, go for it, Liz. Go ahead. Is back to something you were saying about, you know, just encouraging everyone to have a higher degree of self-belief and a higher degree of creativity such that we increase the probability of people like myself and Kyle discovering something, inventing it, seeing an idea through. Like, What are your p practical pieces of advice to either one, learn to take yourself and your ideas more seriously or like the, this, how do you encourage more people to actually run with their ideas so they can mm -hmm. come up with something that saves a million people an hour a day, mm -hmm. which, you know, has its ripple effect. Well, one is like we talked about to believe in yourself and don't let anybody tell you it's not going to work. Keep your eyes open from henceforth, from the day you leave your studio there or your house, tell yourself, I'm going to invent something every day and believe in it. Even if you just do sort of a fake patent, you know, you just say, oh, I'm going to patent this. So as your day goes by, if you find yourself stumbling over something, could be something as silly as a door getting jammed or your car uh, doing something strange, or uh, let's say you get up in the middle of the night and you trip over something and you go, instead of just ignoring that, keep your eyes open and say, hey, there is a solution for this. Let's figure this out. And you'd be surprised. I tell about to teach my fellows that too. We talk about bringing one idea to me every day because they know because they're in the lab all day long, they know more than all the engineers do. They may not know how to know how to put it together. But again, to answer your question, just keep your eyes open and don't be afraid to fail. And don't think that just because somebody has filed patents that are similar that you shouldn't do it because there's quite a bit of bandwidth when it comes to intellectual property. And uh, my son actually came up with this really great idea and he filed some patents on it. And when he did his patent search, he said, oh no, dad, I think somebody already figured this out. Went back and looked at it and said, nah, we'll just, we'll just file around it. Don't be discouraged. A good patent attorney, that's his job is to build a fence. And just, just because someone has something similar, you'd be surprised. Claim language is really, really interesting. And by the way, most patent attorneys are engineers. The, the really good patent attorneys all started out in engineering. And they're probably the smartest people that I've seen, certainly in law, and the ones I fear most, actually, when it comes to depositions and trials, because they're really, really sharp. Other lawyers don't scare me, but, uh, but these guys are really, really smart. And just for fun, just go pull up some patents, just go to, go to Google Patents and read some of the language in there and some of these, some of these technical things. That, that was all written by attorneys, but they're really engineers. It's very interesting. So, so believe in yourself. Keep your eyes open. You see a sliding door, jump through it. Don't be afraid to fail. Okay, and and you're gonna you're gonna fail, but out of that comes great success. It always does. Never it never never fails to happen. One that's very helpful, but one like mental herd block I could anticipate myself or many other people running into is thinking, oh, this is so simple, like this isn't worth my time yeah. to try to figure this yeah. out. Mm -hmm. What's what? How do you get past that? Like, so, do you do market research? Do you just reframe it? It's easy nowadays because of the internet. So um, you look at what is the need? What is the need out there? Let's say you come up with an idea. What's the need? And then how are you gonna, how are you gonna fulfill that need? And then what's the competition? So um, I'll have to think of something while we're talking here about a good example of that. Um, but don't be afraid to push the envelope a little bit. And like I said, even though somebody might have a similar idea, it's not the same. You can always file patents around it. And just a quick word on filing patents. It's pretty easy to get what's called a provisional patent now for a couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And you can do that on legal zoom two or 300 bucks. I think it costs. And that, that gets you a bar date and what's called your bar date. And it also gets you a, a sort of a bookmark in history to protect your idea. You only have a year though, you got to convert it after a year, but that's very important to know also. So if you like your idea, go ahead and file a quick patent on it. It's called a provisional patent. You have one year to convert it, but it, it proves to the world that this was your idea and that becomes the date and time because patent law is all about first to file. Used to be a concept, uh, the 
uh, conception of the idea, but now it's, it's first to file. So real important to get that bar date. And then that gives you a whole year to sort it out, do more research. And you can actually sell it to a company as a provisional patent. Some companies, if they really like the idea, they'll take it and run with it. So that's actually the tougher thing. Coming up with the idea and patenting is easy. The, the next step is very hard, and that is the commercialization of it. And even it could be a great idea, but it, and you could bring it to a company that at that moment, and it could be a wonderful idea, but it's not a good fit for them at that time. They'll pass on it. They could come back to it later, or another company might like it. So there are a lot of examples of that, and all you have to do is just go to Google Patents and just type something in and start reading some of those patents. And it's an incredible discipline to try and protect an idea because it's all language and claims. I've read well, some book, One helpful. Simple Idea is a good book on, on this subject exactly. Um, mm -hmm. I think that we're going to transition now to some more bonus questions or rapid mm -hmm. fire questions. Um, and this one's not even very rapid fire. It's just kind of to signal that we're close to the end. But um, I talked with a cardiologist, cardi, thoracic surgeon, cardiologist uh, this weekend and told him, told her that I was meeting with mm -hmm. you. She's actually also a, a Duke graduate. Her name's Dr. Oh, wow. Skariak. And she, um, she wanted me to ask you mm -hmm. what's next. I know we talked about the incremental advances that are coming. And she said that we've gone from base metal to covered to drug eluding stents and she wants to know yeah. what you see as the as the future so in this space it's interesting someone tried to get away from metal and abbott was a company that thought it's a, this is a good example of a great idea that wasn't really well well thought out and after a billion dollars of investment it finally flopped but they came up with the idea of a bioabsorbable stent it's a good example of something that makes intellectual sense, but the practic practicality of it was that it didn't work at all. And I saw that coming. That was probably the next big hope to get away from the bare metal stent. The drug coating was a big deal. Of course, we were incremental in that in the late 1990s. And our, my, all of my early patents, we included drug coatings on there because we knew that's where the, the stent could become like a portable pharmacy. So the next big step was bioabsorbable. Everybody got all excited about it until you started looking at the data. And <clears throat> to, we don't have enough time to go through it. Um, it does absorb and it does go away, but the numbers, the statistics were just, it's just average. It wasn't as good as metal. So that died a pretty quick death, even though they spent 10 years on it, actually 20 years on it and billions of dollars. Um, so everyone thought that was gonna be the next best thing. Right now, um, there is a stent called the Cobra stent, which is interesting. It, it has nanotechnology. And it's not a real drug. It's just a nano surface, a treatment surface of the metal. And it's actually looks, the data look very good. It looks like it's just as good as our stent and all the other drug coded stents. The, we look at things of stent thrombosis, which should be less than 1%. And then what's called MACE, major adverse clinical events. And it's right in the ballpark. So. That's probably the latest breakthrough. Beyond that, I don't see anything beyond the nano services. I, the, the metal works too good. It's, it's compatible, it's, it's malleable, it's balloon expandable. Uh, right now, there, there's nothing on the horizon for this, for this specific space. My next question for you is, when this was first coming out, you kind of went on a world, the stent, you kind of went on this world tour because you know, a lot of world leaders are older mm -hmm. and you provided a miraculous new opportunity for older people to, uh, you know, be healthier, longer, prevent some adverse effect. Uh, and one of the people you met on that was Lee Kuan Yew, the mm -hmm. leader of Singapore, mm -hmm. who I find to be a very fascinating figure. Incredible. Could you tell us about how you came in contact with him and how that came about and what that experience was like specifically? Cause he's been someone on my radar to study kind of like yeah, a modern, amazing, uh, fascinating incredible, leader. incredible individual. We became very good friends after all that. So the short version of the story is it was not <laughs> planned. I was going, uh, I was going to Bali from San Diego. We were flying, my wife and I were flying to Bali for our anniversary. We decided to take a vacation. I was going to take a vacation for a week. And the first stop was Singapore. And as we were landing, the flight attendant came on the PA system and said, would Dr. Schatz please identify himself? So I'm, I always raise my hand. Yeah, who knows me? And she said, would, and then she makes an announcement, would everybody in the plane please remain seated until Dr. Schatz leaves the airplane? 
is escorted off the airplane. <laughs> so I thought I was in trouble. So we get up. We don't know what's going on. And the flight attendant escorts us out, and there are these military guys with guns. I thought we were going to get arrested. And we didn't get arrested. We're walking down this gangway of military guys with flags and guns. And way in the distance, I see uh, somebody yelling at me and running towards me. And it was a good friend there, Dr. Arthur Tan, who was a cardiologist who I had helped train years ago. And he goes, Richard, Richard, uh, so glad to see you. I said, what are you doing here? <laughs> he says, oh, uh, our senior minister needs, needs a stent. And uh, can you please help me do it? I go, I'm on vacation. <laughs> so anyway, that's how it started. And so we changed our plans. He took us to the palace. We met uh, Mr. Lee. And it was the beginning of a, a wonderful friendship that lasted for many, many years. And uh, it was a lot of fun. That, so that's how I met him. And he had already had a balloon, but it had, it had reached the nose. And so Dr. Tan wanted us to wanted to put another stent in. He wanted me to help him to make sure it went well. Because back then, it was in the 90s. Not everybody was doing a lot of procedures. And so that's how I met him. And everything could have gone better. And it was all over the press. So we got a lot of publicity over it. It was a lot of fun. But. Yeah, one of the one of the great stories uh, that and Mother Teresa, the two my two celebrities. Yeah, those are two pretty big celebrities. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to. Right? Mm -hmm. Not sure anybody will follow that one up with anything <laughs> great. I, let um, me tell you about Mother Teresa. What was so funny was she came in on a Friday, and uh, so my the the young doctor took care of her that weekend, and on Monday they came running in my office. I was on call that weekend, but I swapped call with my partner, so I. They didn't call me, and they came running in my office like two little kids at Christmas. Says, Richard, says, guess who we put a stent down on the weekend? I go, who? It's a guess. I go, oh, I don't know. It's a little Mother Teresa. I go, oh, my God. How did that happen? So they tell me the story. We go up there and see her. And so I called J&J &J right away because the stent was not approved. It was not approved for human use. It was only experimental. And so I called Mike Schuler, the guy I mentioned before, and I go, Hey, Mike, guess who we put a stent in this weekend? He goes, who? I says, got a guess. Come on. He goes, I guess, guess big. He goes, George Bush, this president. I go, no, bigger. And he goes, bigger? I don't know, the Pope? Oh, you're getting close. Bigger. <laughs> so he goes, who? I go, Mother Teresa. He says, oh, my God, did you get a consent form? I says, no, no consent form. Sorry. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's how it all started. And she was with us for about three weeks in the hospital. So we got to, and I, we took her back down. I took her back down a few days later with Patricia Robinell and did another angiogram on her. But that's a great story. One of the funniest. Incredible. Ones. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any non health patents? Oh, let's see. Um, no. I, no. I have some that were in other disciplines. Um, I have I had some catheters that we were using for uh, obstetrics and for infertility way back. We started a little company to, to deliver gametes to the fallopian tube way back, early, mid-90s or so. And I, no, I think all the patents are uh, medical. Yeah, they're all medical. So I have one potentially final question mm -hmm. for you. Do you have a anecdote of any just kind of ordinary student or person just in the back room of a lecture who heard your idea, decided to run with a patent and, and like had a, they took your advice and ran with it and led to some miraculous or even just, well, the, the, yeah, go for it. the tavern story that, that there was a guy in the audience who heard me speak in the late 1980s after I'd already abandoned the patent. I never, I never filed it. And, uh, he just, He's from Norway, and he ran off and filed patents and built some prototypes, and, and that became Tavern. So uh, that's an example. Some of my fellows have also uh, come up with some ideas that they were able to patent. One of my partners, a uh, couple of my partners, in fact, have done that and successfully. Uh, after just working with me, you know, they, they said, hey, if he can do it, I can do it. So actually quite a few good patents came out of our laboratory, yeah, and that was a, as a result of that. Yeah, it's easier than you think. It's it's not that hard once you know the steps, and the key is to protect your idea. That's the most common question I get, and there are just some very specific steps you have to do because you can't discuss it with anybody. You can't make a public disclosure. In fact, when Julio mm -hmm. Julio worked from 1978 to 1985 very quietly, but in 1984 he did make a public disclosure of his idea before he filed the patents. Julio never had any intention of filing the patents. He never considered it until he met me. I, I convinced him to file patents. 
but he had already made a public disclosure at the RSNA meeting in November of 1984. And because of that, we lost our international rights immediately. And we had one year to file patents or else it become public domain. So number one, when you get an idea is don't tell anybody about it, don't make a disclosure. File your, once you file, then you can start talking about it. That's probably the most important lesson. Well, Dr. Schatz, this has been a awesome interview. We are incredibly grateful to you for one, uh, probably people I don't realize in my life that wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they're there because of it. Cause I, you know, plenty of heart problems. That's in America. I don't think it's possible for anyone to not know someone who's had heart right. problems, exactly. if they've met any of their relatives. Uh, so thank you for that. And then thank you, of course, for sharing your time with us today on this podcast. We really grateful for it. Happy to do it. And good luck to you guys. Good luck. And let me know when this comes up where I can take a look at it and watch it. We'll be sure to. By Thank the way, you. there's another thing on uh, online. I don't know if you actually saw it, but there, there are a few of my lectures online. But I also gave the commencement address for uh, California, Northern California State uh, Medical Center. And in there, I talk about all this stuff and sliding doors. If you just look up uh, North State, uh, California, North State Medical Center, you'll see uh, the commencement address. And we talk about a lot of the things that we, uh, we talked about today. So it's a good one. All right. We can leave that in the notes for people who are curious to uh, look that sure. up and hear, hear more from you. Great. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, man. And good luck to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And that wraps up our interview with Dr. Richard Schatz. Another amazing conversation that I thoroughly enjoyed. Obviously, he's an incredible person who's done incredible things for the world. Um, my three takeaways, the first of which are invent one thing a day, first of all, and also know that people are going to call you stupid. I mean, he stood up in front of a room full of people and, and they laughed at him and booed him off the stage or whatever. And it's like that I the idea of that happening is terrifying and something that people have nightmares about. And yet he persevered and changed the world. And like that sort of endurance is what's necessary in order to make amazing things like this happen. Uh, the second is just how life giving this invention is, how many people how many hours were given back to society and to human beings that otherwise they wouldn't have had. And like, you know, the, the next thing is just that the, the sun keeps coming up for Dr. Richard Schatz. He, you know, has his own problems, even though he created this amazing thing. Like it, it, if your goal in life is to run a marathon, you know, the sun comes up the day after you run your marathon and he has to um, continue to, to exist in this world and navigate through his problems just like everybody else even though he invented something so incredibly powerful. And I think that, um, you know, that's just an interesting observation uh, and, and something that I thought about given being in the presence of somebody who operated on <laughs> Lee Kuan Yew. Like that's Hey, you're nuts. taking my takeaways. Hey. Okay, okay. Hey, okay. Go for it. But first of all, very good stuff. Second of all, number one, three takeaways for me. That first of all, health is often avoiding bad as much as it is if not more than adding good. So, you know, keys to heart health, keys to longevity. He's like, don't smoke, don't drink, have a balanced diet. Not like, you know, eat pomegranate seeds and do handstands, which are some of my favorite activities. He didn't say don't do that, but biggest, you know, highest leverage, lowest hanging fruit to not pomegranates was to not do bad things. Second takeaway, this is an interesting spin, is you don't need to be a techie to drive change. Obviously he was a doctor when this came out, but we asked him, you know, if you were not involved, would this have happened? And his answer was yes, probably 10 years later. He was not the genius behind it. He just was the person who had enough of an insight to recognize that his genius friend, Dr. Palmaz, had a genius idea and he drove it forward. So you don't have to be the genius engineer. Your contribution to the world can be taking someone else's idea and instilling confidence in them that their idea is actually useful. So that's really encouraging for those of you who don't like math. Third, even though math is pretty cool and not racist. Third, insane the woke stuff you know kyle gave me that look anyway the third takeaway here is just the insane degrees of separation this is me reveling in the moments of how cool this is about like kyle said we just talked to someone who in, operated on lee kuan yu and singapore is like the model state it's incredibly cool but you know your degree of separation from us anyway but it's just so cool to see that you know we've only been doing this podcast for about 70 episodes or so in the closeness and connectedness of the world at the highest levels really blows your mind when you start to interrogate it through a medium like podcasting. That's all I have to say for this interview. I hope that 
in the spirit of Dr. Schatz, you see the world thinking value add, seeing problems and thinking about solving them rather than complaining about them. Hopefully our show is a source of new ideas for you. If it is, you should probably subscribe, tell a friend, say hey on Twitter, buy some Bitcoin and have a nice life. That's all I have to say this week. See ya. Thank you.